Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to International Telemedicine Grand Rounds. This is year 13 of our meeting. I would like to introduce you, Dr. John Garcia. He's a trauma fellow at UM GX Memorial Hospital. He's going to present a, a case that's going to generate some interesting discussion. I'm looking forward for the, everybody's participation. Thank you. Thank you for presenting, John. Yeah, of course. Thank you very much, and nice to meet everybody. Um, everybody can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Um, so some objectives for this session, uh, review management of blunt trauma in the pregnant patient, um, review pharmacologic adjuncts to contract uterine bleeding, um, discuss intraoperative and postoperative techniques for uterine bleeding control. Um, so the Initial uh, trauma presentation was uh, estimated to be a 30-year-old female, high-speed, highway rollover MVC, um, estimated by EMS to be at 30 weeks of gestation. GCS at the scene was 14 uh, for confusion, reported to be hypotensive and tachycardic. Um, initially arrived with airway intact, uh, normal bilateral breath sounds, blood pressure, uh, systolics in the 80s to 90s, over 50s to 60s, um, tachycardic with a respiratory rate in the 40s, though satting 100%. Um, she was GCS approximately 14, but more than confusion, she was extremely, extremely anxious. Um, on secondary survey, the FAST exam was floridly positive. Uh, the chest x-ray, which we'll see on the next slide, had no abnormality, uh, deferred the pelvic x-ray. Um, and on a brief secondary exam, the only other significant finding was swelling, tenderness of the bilateral mandible. Um, so this is her chest x-ray. Give everybody a second. And then, so I guess we'll open that up to what, what's the next step here? So let's go around the room, Dr. Superak. What should you do with this, with this patient at this point? Uh, I think she's in shock and the bleeding is in the abdomen. So so she's going to need to be explored. And I'll call the OB people to check on the baby. And uh, maybe uh, if the baby is ready or the baby is in trouble, we, we can terminate the pregnancy and call the, the pediatrician to, to help uh, receive the, the baby if uh, they decide to take the baby out. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Eckstein, what do you do with this situation now? Dr. Yes, so I, I agree with Dr. Uh, Supa. She's in shock and, and severely dyspneic and, and anxious. So um, I, the two large poor IVs <clears throat> call for a rapid transfusion uh, uh, protocol um, and, and have some um, O negative blood if you have it since she's childbearing. Uh, if not, then she'll need to get O positive. And then uh, as part of the FAST exam for a pregnant patient, I would uh, look at the uterus to see if the, if the fetus is still viable. If uh, if there's no heart uh, uh, beating, then uh, just worrying about the mother. And uh, uh, and if it's the, the heart's beating, but it's slow, there's, there's a fetal distress, but she needs to get to the OR. I agree with Dr. Supa. And I would consider possibly intubating her um, first, unless you can get to the OR very quickly. Thank you, Dr. Ondrak. Dr. Marcelo Ribeiro. You need to unmute, doctor. For Ribeiro? Okay. Anybody else want to comment, Dr. Epstein? Dr. Calderon? Okay, let's keep going. Dr. Uh, Yasha, what, what did you do next? So to address a couple of those points on the FAST, we actually could could not find the baby on the FAST, believe it or not, which is a, a sign of what's to come. 
Um, and we did have two large bore IVs in place and we're lucky enough to have the OB team on standby ready to go as well as the PICU team on standby ready to go, which is sort of uh, when one of these comes in sort of a, a default for the institution, which is is nice to have kind of all hands on deck for this situation. Um, but we did exactly as everybody said, called for a massive transfusion. She got uh, two units of O negative in the recess bay and then we proceeded to the immediately to the operating room um, from there. Um, so how would you approach this? I think we sort of talked a little bit about it, but um, so I'll just kind of go to the next slide. We did an exploratory laparotomy. Um, this is where the title of the slide comes from. Actually, on fascial incision, um, copious blood came out as well as a foot. Um, so the actual baby's leg kind of came out the fascial incision, which caused me to freeze for a couple seconds, to be totally honest. Um, and the resident from across the table yelled, baby, baby, baby at me. So that's where the title of this uh, this this talk comes from. Um, so on getting into the abdomen, there is a copious blood, as we said, a free floating fetus, which um, and an obvious transpondyl uterine rupture with the uterus wide open. Um, and at this point, we had significant pelvic and vaginal bleeding. And we actually got our first gas um, with intubation in the OR. We did not get a recess in the trauma bay. We got our first gas with the arterial line. Um, which you can see there just after intubation. Um, so continuing at the case, in conjunction with OB, we delivered the fetus, handed that off to the NICU team. Uh, the placenta was sort of barely hanging on to the ruptured uterus, uh, so um, removed the remainder of that and delivered. Um, the OB team repaired uh, the uterus with uh, running vicral sutures. We had packed the upper abdomen um, and she got 30 units of oxytocin at that time, which I think is important, but we'll come back to the pharmacologic management just to talk about some of the options. Um, we ran the bowel and checked her solid organs. It looked like uh, her hepatic flexure had sort of been adherent to the liver and tore off a little bit. So she got a serosal repair of the hepatic flexure and there was a liver capsule, capsular tear, which was cauterized um, at that point. Um, so now at this point, it was a, a little while into the case, probably about 45 minutes or so into the case. And now we have blood welling up in the pelvis again. The uterus again appeared atonic and she was again having um, significant uterine bleeding. So this is sort of the next stop to, to pause for to discuss the case. Yeah, Dr. Ultrak, you can see that that was a very complex situation that is a classic HLS uh, okay, right. So the patient came in shock. She's pregnant. You had a high suspicion. We had a high suspicion before going to the OR of uterine rupture, right? Because all this free fluid uh, and or any any other major bleeding in the solid organ. There's a little the fast. So then we went to the OR and found this uterine rupture, right? So now what? So how how do you manage the situation after delivering the baby? Yeah, so at least that you you did uh, remove the baby very quickly, so that that's a bit of an advantage. And basically, uh, the uh, the baby did part of the C-section for you, so so that's good. And um, the the um, uh, OB the the obstetricians would have uh, seen they would have gotten a look inside where if the bleeding was coming from from the the fund from the from the uterus, uh, they they could pack it for you, but. Uh, a quick way to stop the bleeding if it's really just coming uh, from the uterus or even uh, even from elsewhere in the pelvis uh, to get control of the situation, you can put a Reboa in the um, the uh, zone three position and that'll stop. That'll give you, you can have 45 minutes to figure out where the bleeding is coming from to save the uterus. Uh, if you um, if you can't do that, you can't find where the bleeding's coming from, you, or, or you can't really stop the bleeding, um, uh, you might need to proceed uh, to save the mother's life with a, with a hysterectomy. And in this case, if she needed a hysterectomy, uh, I would do a super cervical uh, hysterectomy, like the gynecologist used to do in the old days, uh, to avoid injuring the ureters. Dr. Um, uh, uh, Collet presented a, a similar case um, where, in fact, the baby uh, was dead. They weren't aware at the time, but the, the bullet went through the baby's heart. And um, uh, so they spent some time, you know, trying to save the baby at first. But, and then they, they proceeded with a, with a classical hysterectomy 
got injuries to the ureters, had to implant them. That made a long operation on the patients to come. Uh, but uh, in, in this case, you can do a quick supracervical hysterectomy. You just uh, uh, you can save the leave the fallopian tubes and, and the ovaries and uh, just dissect down to the cervix, uh, div uh, divide the uh, ascending uh, uterine arteries, and then then transect the um, the uterus between the uterus and the cervix, and you're done. Um, uh, but you know, depending on whether she has other children, if this baby survives. You know, she's 30 years old, and it, it may be it, if you can save the uterus and save the mother, uh, both, then um, it, you can put the Rebola up and, and uh, see what you can do over, over the next 30 minutes while you resuscitate the patient as well. Okay, thank you. Dr. Superak. Uh, I agree with uh, Rebola for, for this patient if you have an access to that. Uh, and if you have intervention interventional radiologist on a call, you can uh, call them in after you stabilize her with a rebore to think about an option of uh, embolizing some uh, bleeding part uh, from uterine arteries. Uh, but if you don't have a rebore or IR access, I think the quickest way to control the bleeding is to do the intra-abdominal aortic cross clamping. You're going to get the same effect as a rebore. And uh, then you reassess the, the situation. Uh, I think the patient is not uh, doing well at, at this point. So damage control uh, option is uh, the, the, the smart way to go. And I, I would go with uh, maybe hysterectomy and pack the pelvis uh, to, to try to uh, terminate the bleeding and the operation and bring her back to the ICU for resuscitation. Thank you. Thank you. Alex. How are you? So, blood trauma, pregnant lady, uh, shock in the trauma bay, uh, do it elect, the, the baby was out of the uterus, and you, you deliver the baby, the baby is not in good conditions, the pediatrics are working the, uh, on the baby, and then the patient is receiving transfusion, uh, but the uterus is still bleeding. So, what should you do? Um, so the delivery was uh, via a C section or exporter laparotomy and transabdominal yeah. or just yeah, yeah. the baby yeah. was just in the belly. Okay. Um, I so uterine rupture basically. Yeah, to complete uh, from fallopian tube to fallopian tube, a complete fundal rupture of the uterus. Which at this point, uh, OBGYN has repaired, um, and the uterus actually with a little bit of massage. Um, had some pretty good tone initially. Um, so we stuck with the repair initially, completed the rest of the X-Lab. There were no other major injuries, um, no other major sources of okay, bleeding yeah. in the upper abdomen, unpacked the upper abdomen. That all looked okay. Bowel looked okay. Um, so then we unpacked the pelvis and then we had an atonic uterus um, that was bleeding through the through the um, repair as well as bleeding vaginally at this point. Mm -hmm. Well, I would definitely take advantage of the the fact that the belly is, is open and just manually squeeze the uterus. Mm -hmm. I would also ask at the same time the the GYN team who is probably encountering this more frequently than us to maximize everything medically uh, possible in terms of medications that can be given to increase the contraction of the uterus. Um, I think there are also devices that have never used one, but like some sort of balloon that's placed inside the uterus and inflated along with compression from the outside to kind of halt the bleeding. Um, and uh, if if those don't work, I think I agree with uh, my other colleague said uh, with regards to the Reboa uh, and even uh, hysterectomy. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Glad that you mentioned the balloon, right? That's something that the intrauterine balloon is something that we don't know a lot in trauma, but it looks like something that they use a lot in OBGYN. Uh, any other comments today, Dr. Epstein? Uh, not really. I think uh, it would be time for hysterectomy here. You also had mentioned oxytocin in the beginning and let uh, OB give what they need to do. But I wouldn't prolong everything. Yeah. Dr. Yoshiro Kobe, Dr. Kobe, any, any other comment, anything else to add for the situation? Okay. So 
uh, did you receive any advice from the gynae for pressure? Only so, um, did you perform the laparotomy uh, only by only trauma surgeon? Uh, we we had support from OBGYN at this point. Yep, okay. they were there. Yep. Is there any specific advice from gynae? There is. So I think it's probably a good time to just uh, put this slide up. So, um, so encountering additional uterine bleeding. So we did still have OB in the room and we gave an additional 30 units of oxytocin as well as a dose of methyl organovine or methogen, um, which is another one of their pharmacologic adjuncts. Um, at this point, the bottom of the uterus had pretty good tone. We're continuing uterine massage. Um, they put absorbable sutures, which I did not know was a thing. So this is something I learned during this case, but just transuterine absorbable sutures, sort of like if you're doing a, um, a Whipple and you put the sutures through the pancreas to compress the arteries on the side. Um, they sort of did the same thing with the uterus with big vicrals um, to give it a little bit more tamponade. And then the intrauterine balloon that we've been talking about is called a Bakri balloon. Um, and they also put one of those in place. Um so that was the um, and then we also left some packing in place in the pelvis. None of the blood seemed to be coming from any extra uterine source, but we did um, leave packing in place. At this point, we had a heart rate and a blood pressure that were much better, but we were cold and coagulopathic. Um, so this seemed to control the bleeding um, at this point. We'd had four plus liters of blood loss. Honestly, that's what we put as our ABL, but it, it was probably more than that. Um, and she had, you can see the transfusion that she got, uh, below here, um, eight, eight and eight plus one of cryo. And she was in the midst of her TXA bolus and drip. Um, so at this point we got, uh, what we felt like was appropriate control of the bleeding. There was nothing else welling up in the pelvis. So we left the packing in place and like people have suggested so far, we did elect for damage control in this situation, um, given the cold coagulopathic nature of the patient. Um, so I guess this is really the question is, does this patient need a post-op CT scan or should she go straight to the ICU for resuscitation? Um, and this could be, you know, and I realize this is a, you could go to the ICU and then get a CT scan. Um, but would you scan this patient post-op or no? Let's go around the room. Dr. Eckstein, what do you do next? I, 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 if she is stable... Uh, you're going to put her on a gurney. You're going to, you can take her right to CAT scan and then go right up to the ICU. After all, she was coagulopathic. Her, she was anxious. You don't know if there's head trauma and you don't know if there's bleeding that's coming around at, at this point. So I would go to CT and then to the ICU. Full team to the CT. Thank you. Alex? Yeah, I mean... It depends on on what you're worried about uh, that you're missing, um, and you know, as things mentioned, you know, you know, you want to make sure there's no head injury, spine. I think you were in the abdomen and you looked at everything, and probably um, most of the force was from that trauma was taken by the uterus, uh, unfortunately. But uh, I I would definitely scan uh, this patient before or after getting the ICU. It depends on how stable it is the patient is. Thank you. Dr. Omotrak? Yes, so this was an unrestrained rollover, is that right? No, she wasn't wearing a seatbelt? That's correct. She was not wearing a seatbelt, was still yeah. in the car. Yeah. yeah, right. So, you know, certainly rule out a spine injury and and, um, and, and that, that would be my, my biggest concern. Probably doesn't have a head injury. She came awake and um, she was awake the whole time until he put her to sleep. So, yeah, if, if she's stable, I would do CT. If not, I would keep her spine immobile and get it when she is stable. Thank you, right. Dr. Superek. I, I think I would take her to the ICU first uh, for resuscitation and to warm her up and uh, correct her physiologic derangement and CT scan may, maybe later because uh, you got the you got a normal chest X-ray, and uh, you saw everything in the belly already. So the uh, uh, the the injuries that may be missed are head injury and spinal injuries. 
but I think those two can wait because she she was talking. I don't think she's having any serious uh intracranial bleeding at at the point, and anyway she needs to be resuscitated and uh correct uh the caller party. So I, I would go to ICU first. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Kobe. <laughs> Dr. Shirokobi, any other comment? Anybody else want to comment? No, no, no comment, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kobe. Okay, John, keep going. There's What's a, next? There is a hand raised by Dr. Huh? Dr. Ahmad. Huh? Someone raised their hand. Oh, Dr. Ahmad, okay, please. Uh, go yes. Ahead. Hello? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Hello? Yes, yeah, Dr. Amad, please go ahead. Can you? Thank okay. you. Uh, sorry, I came late. I don't know uh, exactly what happened initially. But what are the capacity of the hospital? Do, do you have uh, angioembolization and uh, uh, other facilities? If there is this facility, I think to go to CT scan, we can benefit from CT scan while. Uh... Yep. So that is what we ended up doing. Um, we did, as someone said, full team to the CT scanner. That's that's pretty much what we did. Resident and fellow to the CT scanner. And we actually kept the OR all set up um, in case we saw something we weren't expecting and had to go back there and also had an ICU bed ready for her. Um, so to not go through a bunch of normal CT scan images, her brain was fine. Um, nothing in the brain and actually nothing in the spine, but that mandibular swelling did end up being something. Um, she had a comminuted fracture uh, of the right mandible, uh, which you can see there. Um, and then I thought for demonstration purposes, the intrauterine balloon was in and our pelvic packing was, or intra-abdominal packing was um, interesting to see. Um, we did not uh, find any active extrav. You could see blood products, but there was no active extrav in the uterus anymore. Um, so we also, that was within our, our kind of thought process. If there was something actively bleeding, is it something that we could embolize? Um, there was not um, active bleeding in this case. And then just to prove that our physical exam was right, uh, we did just make sure that the solid organs looked okay. Um, they did um, look okay on the scan. Um, so at this point, we went from the scanner to the ICU. So, so John, um, mm -hmm. Let's make a comment. That, that's something that you do very often in, in Miami. So... We have a case like that. Sometimes you rush the patient to the OR and need to be sure that the brain is okay. And because you had issues with tra patient trauma brain injury as well as the shock. So we usually keep the OR open, keep the, 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 the scrub nurse there, keep, every, keep everything there. Then they take the patient, go to the, the CT scan that's very close to the, to the same floor, very close to our operating room and resource area. With anesthesia, with the trauma team together, with blood products, and then go there, and then you do a CAT scan. Then you can decide what to do. From there, can should go to angioembolization, go come back to the room, have the embolization that in the OR room, or, or then you can plan what to do. So that's very important. You you keep the OR open for if you need other surgeries, or even if the uterus start to, to continue to, to bleed, start to bleed to to do a hysterectomy. So have all the options uh, available, uh, uh, and they are ready to intervene. So that was a very control management of procedure for for this so just just asking the comments from everybody before going to the ICU John anybody would do anything different anybody would uh, with this case kind would do anything different with this patient this time does a super act please uh, as I mentioned I, I think uh, she needs to be resuscitated first and a CT scan is uh, nice to have later at a later stage once uh, once she is stabilized, but uh, by doing that, I I may miss some important injury like uh, other colleagues mentioned, like a serious spinal injury or intracranial hemorrhage. So you have to judge a uh, case by case. Thank you. Thank you. The own track. Yes. Well, how long does that take you? The you know the, the, the little detour to CT and then to the ICU. Is it ten minutes? Roughly, probably, but to get on the scanner, the scan takes longer, but to get from the OR to the scanner and then from the scanner to the ICU is probably a combined 15 minutes or so. So uh, 50, so um, less than 15 minutes, so it's about 10-minute delay 
it had you yep. gone straight to the ICU, it would have taken 10 minutes less. Is that right? Would have taken, yeah, straight to the ICU is yeah. just out of the room, up an elevator. It's right there. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's a matter of judgment. In this case, uh, she was normotensive, no longer tachycardic, and uh, her initial pH was 7. It's at 718, I think you said, which is, yep. yeah, yeah, not horrible. So um, I think that's reasonable uh, in this case. And it's also reasonable in a patient that um, is really uh, cold. And what was her temperature at the end of the operation? 34 and a half degrees Celsius. Yeah. So that's moderate uh, hypothermia. So, you know, if you can keep her warm for in the CAT scan, basically do what you would do initially in the ICU, I think that's okay. A, a, a patient that was really starting to go into the, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, triangle of death, then I would just take right back to the ICU, keep fine and mobile and, um, um, you know, get her resuscitated and then as soon as you can, take it when it's safe, take her back to CT. So either way, and I think you do this all the time and it works for you. So I think that's reasonable with what you did here. Yeah, and to be fair, we do this both ways. If the patient was sicker, we would have gone straight to the ICU, kept spine precautions, done close neuro exams, and then scanned her once we had her a little more settled down. She was cold and coagulopathic, but we had what looked like pretty good control of the bleeding intra-abdominally. Um, we had it kept a bear hugger on her. We could all walk over there with her. Um, so we decided to do it first. But I think this is heavily patient and institution dependent, depending on where your scanner is, how quickly you can do that. Luckily, they're kind of used to us doing this here. So we can call from the OR and say, we're coming to scan, you know, intraoperative essentially scan, and we're leaving the OR open. They clear a spot for us. We go right in the door. Um, it works pretty well. Um, it did not work as well at my prior institution. There was no scanner right outside the OR. So this would have 100% of the time gone to an ICU first where I trained for residency. Um, I think that's one of one of the real benefits, too, of being here is things like that are, are well sorted out already. Okay. All right. So, uh, mm -hmm. Any other comments? Yeah, I'm comment. sorry. I'm, I certainly wouldn't have considered uh, going to IR after this. I think it was mentioned briefly, but that's that's for sure a place I wouldn't want to go. Yeah, they would come to us, luckily. We would have made them come back to the open OR, I think, in this case. Okay. Anybody else? Dr. Kobe? Okay, no uh, comment. But so I would like to ask one question. How, what device did you manage uh, this with open abdomen? The open abdomen. We uh, oh, I should have put a picture. We um, we sort of do a cassette drape, a perforated cassette drape, lap pads, two JP drains, and an IABAN. Um, so we sort of fashion our own open abdomen dressing. Um, so we can still see into the belly through the middle of it. Um, I've used Abthera before. I think the one disadvantage of Abthera is that you can't see into the belly well. Um, but in this case, we sort of did, did the build your own method. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Alex, any other comment? Yeah, so uh, uh, here where I'm at, so we have a, a operating room in the in the ER. It's not a big OR, but it's it's good for you know interventions like like this uh but once you leave the edor the the policy here is that you cannot go back to it um so the scan is closed um and the ors are in the set in the same building but at a different floor so if we would need to go back to the or we, we can go back to that edor which is right next to the trauma base like you know the writer who have to go to a different floor but luckily still in the same building um so or IR, which is also the same building. Okay, so Joe. All right, so we'll go ahead. So luckily the course in the IR was not, um, in the ICU rather, was not um, particularly complicated. Luckily, we did find out afterwards she was so anxious she wasn't really answering our questions. She was actually a 23-year-old. Um, this was her first pregnancy. We found this out from family once we were able to get a hold of them. Um, so we were pretty happy that we were able to save the uterus um, in this case. 
Um, she was resuscitated. She, as a, as most he healthy 23 year olds do, corrected her acidosis pretty quickly. Um, within the first 24 hours, uh, she got another four units of FFP. I think one of cryo and one of platelets. Um, if I remember correctly, that might be off by a unit or two, but not by much. Um, her TEG uh, corrected um, uh, with blood products. Her ventilator was weaned to SIMV and pressure support um, by about 30 or so hours after the operation. Um, so post-op day two in the morning, um, the Bakri balloon came out. Uh, there was minimal vaginal bleeding at that point. Um, so we went back to the, uh, I put those in reverse order, sorry. We went back to the operating room, um, removed the packing, again, did a survey, did not find any additional injuries, uh, bleeding had subsided. Uh, we washed out and closed the abdomen at that point. Um, so additionally, your post-operative course, she was extubated um, the day after that. Um, and then post-op day six, went to the operating room with OMFS and had her mandible um, fixated, um, tolerated actually post-op day seven was tolerating a diet just fine, um, was on a liquid diet um, for a week after that and then started to take some solid foods. Uh, post-op day 11, she was getting really, we were kind of watching a white count that was staying high, um, decided to scan her at that point because she was getting anxious to see the baby. So the baby actually did get a heartbeat back um, and sustained it was intubated in the NICU. This also was almost a term baby. I think she said she was 34 weeks. Um, so nearly a term baby. Um, neurologically, the baby was not doing well, but it did get a heart, did recover its heartbeat and uh, breathing. Um, she got a scan on the uh, post-op day 11, unremarkable imaging, uh, showed the uterine repair um, and showed trace fluid in the pelvis and a little bit of uh, a pleural effusion, but really nothing to write home about. So at that point, we felt safe letting her go to be with the baby. Um, so she was discharged post-op day 12. Um, she has since returned and is doing well at this point. So with that, we can, oops, um, we can discuss questions or go from there. I think the big take homes for me, I didn't even know what methergen was before this case. I know, know that I'll always have OB uh, support, so it's good to review those meds. So oxytocin, I, I knew about methergen, I did not. Um, I did know not know that an intrauterine balloon was even really an option in this case. I, I would have jumped to a hysterectomy, just like most people, um, or a lot of people had said, um, like a super cervical hysterectomy, just like it was described. That's the only only way I've seen it done so far as a, in emergencies. So um, I think that was important um, to know that you have other adjuncts available. Um, and then I think uh, the CT scan um, kind of planning and, and how you leave the OR with all, leave your all of your options open during your CT scan was, was an important learning point for me. This is the first time I've done this here and it, it works a lot smoother here than where I was before. So I think those were the, the important things for me. Dr. Martos, you're muted. Thank you, Joe, for a great presentation. <laughs> yeah, but on track, your comments are lessons learning and, and how would you manage this patient, patient like yeah, that in the very, future? Very, yes, very well done. So uh, the, the Bakke balloon, was it placed through the um, the hhysterotomy repair? Uh, through, transvaginal. Transvaginal transvaginal. Yep, yeah. yeah, so, so right. The, the, but I, the patient was uh, supine, I imagine. So you know, you have to re, you have to reposition her. To okay, there you go. Yeah, and then we had some some manual support there, and, and OB still in the room, so we were able to uh to get the positioning adequate to to be able to do this transvaginally. Right. Okay. And I, I, did, is it an option to to since you already have uh, uh, the uterus had been open repaired? Is it an option to pass it through the through the suture line in the, in the uterus. Do you know? You know, I, I don't know. I, I read a little bit about this for these. I did not see anything about that, but I don't see why it wouldn't be <laughs> to snip a suture yeah. and be able to put it straight through there and, and blow it up. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, so that's uh it's nice to know about the balloon. I guess that works yeah. better than just packing the uterus with and, and you can remove, you know, you can insert it uh, through in typical OB cases through the cervix and inflate and remove it easy, easier than you can pack. So it's, it's nice to know about that option. And also, um, so how's the baby doing now? Is he, is he alert or he or she alert or is it, 
Wait. So, so the last I checked, there really wasn't much neurologically, uh, unfortunately. Um, was breathing, uh, had a heartbeat, but I think neurologically devastated, un unfortunately. But yeah, um, it was pulse pulseless and blue when it came out of the belly. So, you know, you can yeah, hope, well, for, hope for some recovery in these little, little ones, but. Yeah. But at least you saved the uterus. So that part's good. It would have been, would have been yeah. that much uh, worse. And then was she the driver? She was so alone in the car. Just her. Just her. So there you go. It's still, it's still better to wear a seatbelt, I guess, right? Uh, with, with a big belly. But um, anyway, well done. So, Dr. Alex? Um. Very nice presentation. Thank you for presenting this. Uh, I, th there are not many cases like this, so I think we all learned a lot. Um, I I I do remember the Bakri balloon from I forgot the name, but from taking care of a GYN patient with OB patient in the in the unit with bleeding and whatnot, and came with the Bakri balloon and uh, definitely helped. Uh, <clears throat> I I think as a fellow, I remember at Ryder there was. One other case, there was a gunshot wound to the uterus. Uh, but yeah, thank you for presenting this. Um, and uh, I learned a lot. Um, and yeah. congratulations on a nice presentation. Yeah. I, I think that every every time, we have a lot of patients that receive a really, really high potential for, for a long time. And sometimes I remember a couple of patients that have prolonged uh, high potential due to patients being a long, a prolonged strication on the field. Or sometimes this patient easily can can be 20, 30 minutes until from the scene, from the time the trial the crash until the EMS arrived and bring back to the scene. And I know that has some patients with like after prolonged hypotension, patient came back, then we walk, I had two patients, they woke up with uh, blind and then and then we found out they have optic nerve ischemia due to prolonged hypotension, right? Uh, and I, I think this is another situation. Again, when I have seen somebody in shock like this. This was probably 30 minutes after the, the crash, et cetera. We need to go fast and it, we knew since the beginning that the baby couldn't be in harm. So, uh, and again, that's the came the, the best treatment for the baby is treating the mother. And at the time we try to save the, the lives of the mother going as fast as you should to the OR, but that's a problem that you have in prolonged hypo, hypovolemia uh, and hypotension. This was uh, exactly the case for this patient. Dr. Epstein, your, your comments, any, any, anything to do different or any suggestion for our next next case like this? No, no. the uh, Bakri balloon, you have to be very careful uh, about how you inflate it. Don't forget you've sutured the uterus. So you can only inflate it just so much and transcervical is, is much better than going in through the abdomen. And yes, you need a lot of help to do it, but great case, great outcome. And the, the beauty is the youth. Yeah. Yeah. If she weren't 23, I think that she would have been, you know, we would have, for the amount of bleeding, she did remarkably well. So young physiology is nice. I think Dr. Rivero had a hand up, I think. Yeah. Just, okay. just a quick question. Um, sorry. Uh, the time you called me, Martos, I was, I was taking a phone call. But yeah, just question for you guys. Do you usually place an arterial line on the, in, in patients with severe shock? like in the ED, because this is one policy we're trying to apply here in our service. Every patient get, gets to ED with a very severe shock. Uh, once we activate massive transfusion protocol, we immediately place a left uh, femoral arterial line in case we need to use the reboa, because this would be a very nice case to have a reboa in place. Yeah, that's something we can talk about. We put it in, in this case, we put it in the, we just proceeded basically straight. She was only in recess for a grand total of 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and we were in the OR, so we went straight to uh, to the OR and placed it there. Um, I think when the transit time is going to be that quick, that's okay. Um, but yeah, I agree. A Reboa is not something I immediately thought about in this case. It probably should have been. So yeah, and introduce like uh, there's actually a line that you can keep the introduce like you can have the A line and have an introducer big enough to put the Reboa through. That probably would have been a smart decision in this case. Yeah, because. Yeah. It, it, at least so far, we bought the, the second main indication for we bought nowadays is usually this obstetric and gynecological case with severe bleeding. So it would be maybe a tool to help you guys, you know, taking control of the bleeding. But very well done, very nice case. 
Yeah, so Marcelo, I, 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 I'm, I'm one of the advocates to put a, a lines in, 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 in at the, the research station area. Most of the patients, for the patient that you want to control, they are blood pressure is okay. Then you're gonna go to CAT scan, but she had a positive fast, had free fluid in the belly, she was in shock. Uh, we, we prefer to send her straight to the OR, and then Anesthesia did, did, they like place the line in the OR. So I wanted to, to go to, to the OR as soon as possible, and, and in this situation with. And it sees you place the, the, the line over there, but it was not a firm. Again, you want you to do it like as, as soon as possible in this situation. But yes, that, that could be a good indication for the reboa. Uh, but again, as soon as you open the patient, we, we deliver the baby, and we, you saw, saw there's no other bleeding happening, or just the uterus and did the, the, the BGO and did the, the buttocks repair. Again, the, the patient was. At the point, and after the transfusion, the paper was never in shock again. He was, the blood pressure, the vital signs are normalized, and then you're just dealing with the bleeding, but you are, she's not in shock. But like, yeah, the book could be a consideration. All right, thank you. Okay. Dr. Superak. Uh, very nice uh, save for, for this lady. Uh, she was very lucky to, to have seen you you guys in the rider. And uh, I this is the first time I have ever heard or seen the Macri balloon. So I learn new thing every time I join this conference. Very educational. Thank you very much. And congratulations for the great save you did. And, and Marcelo, just compliment your comment, right? So you just came from Pan America Travel Society meeting in Florianopolis. And I, I, I heard from most people in Brazil, they don't have Rebo yet. I, I, I know in most place in South America they don't have. So that's that's another thing about this conference. Uh, you can do this in the United States, in Canada, and maybe in Colombia, but there are a lot of places where you don't have Rebo. So that's a good way to show how you can still can manage trauma without the Rebo, right? And and do old fashioned and 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 and, and save the patient. In this situation the patient was continuing bleeding, I would say that uh hysterectomy was another option. You put the patient back to OR, and you have can have do a hybrid room, have 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 uh, IR going there to embolization, to have a rebo. But if your patient was in shock, for sure rebo would be an option. But since the patient was having some uterine bleeding, but not in shock, so again, massive transfusion protocol, uh, level one refusal, etc. Everything, Belmont, everything, she was under control. We're able to to manage this without IR, without without rebo, and adjust with the old compression. To the bottom. Yeah, but that's true. You know, unfortunately, probably most of the vast majority of the places in South America, in Latin America, this patient would end up with a hysterectomy, and and that's it. Because you know, most of the places they don't have interventional radiology, they don't have repo, and most of them, unfortunately, they don't even have massive transfusion protocols well established. So, uh, look for this young lady that she was in a in a big center with everything available. Because you know, I, I'm pretty sure that in, in you know some places in South America, she would end up at most with the uh, without the uterus for sure. That would I would probably do in my place in the hospital in Brazil when I used to work before I came to UAE for for sure. Yeah. Dr. Kobe, any other comments, dear Okay, great. Welcome, great presentation. So I believe. Uh, Decision to rapid transfer to the OR save her. So I'd like to ask one question. So how long did it take to the uh, OR from the ER? Uh, from the ER to the OR was a total of about 15 minutes. She presented at, I believe, 10.43 a.m. And we were in the OR. Uh, the A-line placement was the first like note of time. I think the other times are made up. Uh, but the A-line placement was placed at, I think, 11.01, so a grand total of, of about 15 to 20 minutes between arrival and OR. Yeah, she, she was there faster, but uh, then when you transfer the patient, put that. And again, this thing is not so, not a waste, of, a waste of time. And again, when you place the patient in the OR, you start to open the box, the, 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 the surgical trays, et cetera, intubation. And, and I would say she was on the table way shorter than 15 minutes, but 15 minutes yeah. time of the A-line, she was intubated before that. Yep. I want this to be to be fast. Uh, and she was already receiving blood products, etc. We, we have a massive transfer protocol in the emergency room. We have blood, I have only cell full blood in the in the trauma bay. And the floor plan, you have the, the resuscitation area, 
the OR is, is 30 minutes, uh, 30 meters away. So it's really, really, really close by. And that's, that's what you do. Okay. And so not to Leboa. Yeah, thank you. So, John, great case. Uh, again, I think like th that's the importance and the goal of this meeting to share experience, to show how to manage this patient in, in, in different locations, different resources. So again, in, in some place, North America and in Middle East, you have a lot of resources. Other places in Latin America, maybe you would manage the patient different different way with the same goal, stop the bleeding and save the life of the mother and, and, and try to save, improving the care of the mother, try to save the baby. And that's the goal of this meeting for the last 13 years. I have an announcement. So next month in September, during the WST meeting, American Association of Trauma meeting, we're going to have a lunch meeting on Wednesday, on the first day of the Congress, where we're going to have a, a, a presentation like this. And we're going to make this meeting for the every second month of the month, second month of the month at uh, noon, we're going to have this meeting in partnership with the American Association for Surgery Trauma. It's going to be an all international meeting. So we're going to continue this way the first and the third month of the month to go to 8 a.m. I really would like to encourage uh, Marcelo, Suprek, uh, Alan, Alon, uh, uh, and San Rizal, everybody from the Middle East, or anybody in your Middle East, to, to keep helping us with the 8 a.m. meeting. I know this is the best time for, for you guys to join to the, the, the time zone. Please present your case on the 8 a.m. meeting, Mondays, uh, the first and the third. The second is going to be at noon with the, with the WST partnership. And the fourth of the, the month is going to be another new Monday, a new, they're going to be keeping keeping doing the schedule. So Alex, please take your case, Supra, and everybody else and stimulate every every other trauma center, every other services to, to contact Liliana. Let's make a nice schedule. This meeting is very important. And during our last review, during the Pan American Society Congress, you had more than 540 meetings like that throughout the year. This, this is the most is the longest uh, and and continuous uh, trauma meeting that you that you know and, and and thank you everybody for making this meeting so special and thank everybody for joining and share your knowledge your expertise I think this is amazing. Please take a note. Uh, we have the you have the CME code uh, uh, on the chat group. The CME code is eleven forty five sixty four and. We're gonna to talk to Liliana. So, Doctor Antrak, uh, uh, please stay in the, the call afterwards. Maybe you can explain uh, Liliana uh, what's happening to see how we're gonna gonna move forward regarding CME. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, see you next Monday. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job, John. Thank you. Doctor Antrak. Yes. Good morning. Yeah. Please stay a little bit. Liliana, are you there? I'm here. Good morning. Yeah. Good so morning. Track. Can you explain, yes. uh, Liliana, what, what you need? What's the next thing? Well, yes, he, I think... Uh, actually, I think he discussed... sent me... Excuse me. Actually, he sent me an email, and that email okay. was forwarded to our CME office because they're the ones that would be in charge of it. Um, uh, They have not gone back to me. As soon uh -huh. as I'm done here, I will follow up and see what's going on because it's really the CME office that needs to deal with me with it more than myself. Am okay. I right, Dr. Antrak? Yes, we know that that's right. And and I think I mentioned that to, to Dr. Yes. Martos in the email that it's really the um, CME office, but I think they probably, uh, they're, they're probably aware of this issue or it's, it's certainly for them, it's pretty straightforward to, to deal with. So, yeah. I tell you what I'll do. As soon as we're done, I'm gonna follow up with them. I'm gonna resend that email and ask for a response, and I'll email you, letting you know what's going on. Well, okay, Sounds because good. I think a lot of the a lot of the surgeons that attend the conference, they you know they use it to maintenance of certification, so it's quite important. Sure. The other thing, uh, while we're talking about Ms. Nakuse, the uh, the July thirty first for some reason, and I know we discussed it, but the you know, the CME office didn't credit me for the July 30th. They, they have not credited you? Okay, because no, no, no. I sent the list of the participants because the following week, I did send you the, I emailed you the code separately and you were able to claim that one, right? Exactly, yes. And okay. I mean, I'll, I'll try. 
I'll tell you today's. I think that the last two I've been able to enter and I haven't done today's yet, but it was just that. And there are a few July other people. 31st? That, July 31st was the only one. There are several other people. He has not been credited. That, okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you, man. You're quite welcome, sir. Have a great day. You Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.